Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm chatting with Michael Collins from Nuclear Fuels. In this interview, we discuss Michael's transition from a gold company to a uranium company now working with nuclear fuels. We also get into Michael's insights on where the uranium market could be heading. And Michael spends a great deal of time breaking down the differences between in situ mining and conventional mining. All right, everybody, enjoy the interview. Michael, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Steve. Always good to be, be talking with you guys. So we chatted a couple of years ago. Um, at that time, you were CEO of a gold explorer in Newfoundland. And now you are with a uranium company, uh, Nuclear Fuels. What, uh, what's your background with uranium? Do, do you actually have more of a uh, background in, in uranium or, or in gold? That, that's a pretty, pretty solid question. Um, I'm actually kind of coming home to uranium. Uranium was uh, the, the space where I ran the first public company that I built. Uh, that was Blue Rock Resources. And we were, I think, the, the only new conventional uh, uranium producer in the U.S., uh, Southwest with a toll mill agreement with uh, Denison. Um, so it's kind of, it's a space I really know. It's actually a space that I avoided for an awful lot of years because I didn't think the economics were there. Um, and about three years ago, I actually made some money on some uranium stocks and and um, and stepped back and I said, well, is this, is this actually real? And kind of looked at the whole thing and decided that it was. Um, and that's how Nuclear fuels really came about. I got together with uh, Bill Sheriff, and they had a project that was more exploration than development over at Encore. Um, and their focus is on on development. So uh, we we put uh, KC the KC project into a new co, a nuclear fuels, and we're off and running. Okay, so let's 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 talk about uranium. Um, uh we've seen quite the run here from the twenties to over a hundred dollars back down to 90. I'm talking about the spot price, of course. And uh, yeah. it seems like we got a little bit more mo momentum again. Uh, what do you think's happening with the price of uranium? You, you've, you've, you've been watching it and involved in it for, you know, 20 years now. What's, what's, what's your take on, on, on where we are uh, with the uranium price? Where it's, yeah, where it's, where it's been, where it's going. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a significant difference between spot and long term contracting prices, um, but uh, that that's a whole different that's a half day class. Um, so spot price has pulled back significantly, but if you look at the run up we had last year, it's not unreasonable. Uh, it's forming a base at this level, and we would expect it to um, retrace over the you know the the 106 that it hit previously. And continue up this year. Um, I don't. I don't personally expect to see two hundred dollar uranium, but right now it's sort of this is kind of one of those lulls where the buyers step back and say, "Well, what what's the best pricing we can get?" And they kind of shake the tree a bit and try to try to push it back down. And and but if you look at the market, the actual contracting market, the the um, filled contracts are going back up again now. Um, you know, February was very quiet, but now they're starting to go out and, and start doing contracts again. And and I think we'll see a uh, spot price um, uh, reverse and, and pick up momentum um, through the year. That's sort of where we're at. So let's, let's talk about uh, nuclear fuels. It's the first time we've had the company on the show. What's the high level yeah. overview for nuclear fuels? All right. So we went public last July. Um, we had a bit of a quiet summer because we had a a, uh, a drill permit that was taking a while to to get approved, uh, but that came in in the fall. We managed to drill 89 drill holes at um, at the Casey project in Wyoming before Christmas. We shut down for Christmas and it was just getting a little bit muddy and messy. Um, we've spent the winter doing planning for resumption of drilling there and expanding our drill permit. Um, we've added a lot of data into our targeting and redefined kind of what we're looking for and how we're going to get there. Uh, built our team out. We've got another three uh, veterans of, of the last cycle who are joining us as uh, field geologists. So building out our team um, and hoping to, you know, the, the snows come off at this point. We're just waiting for 
fields to dry up and the spring storms to pass through and we'll be out there drilling again shortly, hopefully. So I think that one of the big things we need to maybe set the table with, which a lot of people in our audience do know, but I still uh, like to just sort of set that mental framework for those who are maybe early into doing their homework. Uh, we got a pretty big difference between in situ mining compared to say conventional mining. Uh, you're pretty good at explaining stuff. What's what's the difference here, and uh, what is the type of mining that you're planning on doing? Okay, so nuclear fuels is exclusively focused on roll front mineralization and in situ mining, which is a type of our in situ extraction, is what I should say. We don't like to think of it as mining. You're actually pumping oxygenated water into uranium enriched sandstones. Um, the uranium is liberated by the oxygen. It's just a, a change in oxidation state, that um, enriched water is then pumped up and you run it through a resin bed and the resin attracts the uranium. The clean water is then oxygenated again and pumped back down into the into the, uh, into the sandstone. Um, so when you do that, you're really, your production is a well field um, and your processing facility is a bunch of tanks. And then at the end of it, sort of, um, uh, a precipitation unit and then a drying facility. So you don't have a crushing mill, you don't have any jaw mills, you don't have any explosives on site, you don't have a tailings facility, there's no vent raises, there's no big trucks. Um, it's it's a whole lot cleaner, it's a whole lot faster uh, for, the, for, for the extraction process. But one of the key things for me, um, which is why I, I got involved in this project is that it's a whole lot faster to permit, especially in Wyoming and in Texas, uh, which are agreement states in the U.S. And that means that um, the federal regulatory uh, process is devolved to the state. So it happens in, in one shop. You go to the environmental department and the environmental department addresses both the state and the federal uh, regulations at the same time. So you receive when you receive your permit, you get it from everybody. So you don't have to go through this federal and then state process that you do in a lot of other uh, locations. So we're pretty excited to be in Wyoming. Wyoming, you know, there are over, I think, seven operations uh, that have been historically permitted that are either on standby or going back into production now, or there's one that's actually producing with UR Energy. But fundamentally, you've got, um, uh, this pathway that's very clear and clean. You have regulators who understand what you're trying to do, and you have communities that, you know, people in the communities work on these projects around the Powder River Basin, and everybody understands it. And it's, you know, it's it's a known commodity, so it's not controversial. And the clean, straight straight line to go to production for the most part, um, and then building one of these operations to go to year. If we're talking, I assume that let's let's say that you find a discovery. Um, so you have one drill campaign and you, you get great grades and you say, OK, we got something here. I assume that you're going to have to do a fair bit more drilling before uh, you're going to get that to production. Um, how t Typically, what does that sort of timeline look like uh from the time that you, you 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 hit a drill hole that's really exciting to the point that you're uh, going to production in say Wyoming or Texas. Yeah, so um, expiration. You're looking at drilling, say on uh, you know our target is to do it on 300 foot uh, fences, and then doing infill you know at at uh, at 100 foot uh, spacings for your fences on the roll fronts. Um, so that's something you know you can achieve in a year uh and then and then going from that you don't actually want to go to a measured by the time you have the drill density to do a measured uh resource at that point you're looking at your mine plan and the measured you know drilling is those those holes will be production so you don't actually end up doing that you just stay at indicated for these things uh there's a little bit of drilling that you have to do core samples for met work so you take a large size core and you'll actually um, encapsulate it and push uh, oxygenated water through it uh, to test how it it actually extracts and what sort of time and how much water you've got to push through it to to make that happen. And those things um, that 
that's relatively quickly. You're looking, you know, at four to six months for your metallurgical testing. Um, one of the other spectacular things about the KC project is about 95% of our ground is either private surface or it's state leases. And the ability to uh, move drill locations and um, to drill on demand as opposed to um, having a drill site that you can't move more than 20 feet either way on um, gives us an awful lot of flexibility in terms of following these mineralized systems in real time. So when we we have a drill turning in the field, we'll have a geologist, what they call sitting the rig, and they'll be watching the drill cuttings coming up and they'll be analyzing them as they go by. And they've got a little handheld, you know, scintillometer, Geiger counter thing. But they do all of that stuff in the field real time. And then they go, oh, I want next hole over there. And the the truck, the drill rig drives over and spuds the next hole. If we were doing hard rock, we would be waiting for three months for our assays before we could go back and drill another hole. Although I guess with uranium, to a certain extent, they can still do, you know, um, downhole logging and they can do a bit of, um, you know, scintillometer readings on the core. But fundamentally, it's just so much faster to do this, like what we're doing with, with ISR. And so it speeds up our timeline. You know, we're looking at uh, really this year. Last year, we, we did um, confirmation drilling. We did infill drilling. Um, and we did expansion drilling this year. We'll be stepping out more and doing a lot more um, expansion and identification of uh, inferred resources to build our inferred resource base. And we expect to be able to jump quickly because we just have that uh, optionality in terms of where we can drill and when. So, Michael, I, I don't mean to sound um, uh, like I'm being negative or anything here, but I look at the uranium intercepts that you guys have, and just from my retail investor standpoint, yep. they they don't seem particularly big. Um, what am I missing here? Why, why are the drill results exciting? Okay, so if you had a very large-scale open pit, yeah, you know, having um, four or six feet of mineralization really doesn't cut it. They're not super high-grade. But again, your your production is being done through a well field. So you're not moving any rock. Um, you're just drilling a bunch of holes, which is you know quite cheap. I think our um, all-in drill costs are about $60 US um, a meter. And that includes planning, drilling, reclamation, geology work, uh, logging, downhole gamma logging to give us an assay um, and build our model. You, you can't compare those kind of cost models to anything else and that that cost model goes forward into your production so we don't if you go to produce that you don't have um big jaw crushers um trucks that are costing eight million dollars a piece um all of those things kind of go away so uh and also the timeline for building so if your permit in wyoming takes two to three years and it takes you one year to build um, uh, an in-situ recovery operation, then, you know, you're just so much farther ahead than, you know, getting eight feet at, you know, at 10, 10%, that's 300 meters below the surface. You know, it, it's, that, those are fabulous numbers. And as a geologist, I'd love to be involved in that, but pragmatically and wanting to make money, uh, for both myself and my shareholders, um, ISR is just the way to go. Nuclear Fuels has an arrangement with Encore Energy related to the KC project. Can you break down the terms of the deal for us uh, in, in simple terms? Okay, so Encore has the right to back into a 51% interest in return for returning two and a half times the expiration dollars that we spend to get a 15 million pound um, indicated and inferred resource. Um, plus, they will finance our 49% interest in the project. So we've got that unique uh, situation where we've, we've, we're we going to be a producer down the road. We don't have to build the technical team to do it. Um, we've got cash in the bank, so we're not diluting along the way. We can continue to be an explorer and kind of bridge the valley of death and the Lassonde curve. You know, that big dip while everyone yep. waits for, right? 
So, but if you can actually continue to build resources and and demonstrate other projects on the road to production, then there's a reason to hold your stock. Um, so it's that kind of very sweet spot in the in the market where we've got low dilution to get into production, but at the same time, um, keeping giving people a reason to keep hold on to our stock going down the road. So yeah, we're pretty excited about that opportunity. So you guys currently hold a hundred percent of the project and then Encore has correct. the option. Okay. Once we, once we, the trigger is, um, um, a 15 million pound, um, indicated and inferred resource. Okay. Um, now from a, from an equity storytelling standpoint, uh, is, are there any concerns here at all that your flagship asset could be taken from you? Or is it like at that point, like, Hey, we found a discovery. Everybody's happy. You know, we've got that we've got moonshine um great potential to be a company maker as well so if we if we lose 51 percent of our cornerstone asset but it turns into a producer and we've got lots of money to explore these other projects and bring those towards production decisions as well i think we're in a, a great space if they had a um a 51 percent back into the company's projects as a whole that would be a different story that would be more difficult from an equity position but we've got lots of opportunities left within the company. So I know a big concern amongst retail investors in Canada, uh, where especially when capital's not flowing, it it's, it feels like it's even worse. But it's always a concern is the cap table. How how much have people paid for shares? Uh, how do they know that if they buy shares open market uh, at today's price, that there isn't somebody who paid you know half a penny for their shares is going to come in and sideswipe them? What can you tell us about your cap table? How can retail investors get comfort uh, with 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 uh, the price that it has been paid for the shares that do exist? All right. Well, I guess I would say we raised um, uh, over six and a half million at uh, sixty cents uh, with a half warrant at eighty cents for three years in a bot deal in January, um, and that was, I think, pretty solid thing to have happen. Um, the vast majority of the money in the company was raised at uh, 50 cents privately uh, with no warrant. And then um, I think of it, yeah, there were some founder shares, half a million at you know two and a half cents or three cents or something like that, but not really that material. And the rest of it was um, significantly higher. So uh, good structure. When you look at um, those you know founder shares, they're all wrapped up um, in escrow. Uh, we had a 36 month escrow. Um, I think we have something in the order of 10 million, north of 10 million shares are still escrowed of the original, I want to say 13, but I'm not sure. But um, yeah, Encore, all the insiders, all the management, we were all escrowed when we RTO'd last July. So. So my producer, Chris, keeps asking me, well, you got some rocks behind you. What, can you tell us uh, what's significant about uh, these rocks that you've decided to keep? Okay, well, I, I don't have anyone, any uranium ones around because people get upset when, when you put those in their building. So I don't know. <laughs> I've got one, one of my favorite rocks here is actually a, um, a volcanic bomb uh, from, that I picked up uh, near a town called Compostela, north of Puerto Vallarta in, um, in Mexico. And it actually flew, it had to have flown from a volcano at least seven miles away. And you can kind of see the striations. That's like wind striations as the as the um, uh, the, the rock. The, it was a molten mass flew through the air. And then on the bottom, you can see where it landed in a riverbed, and that's the impression of all the rocks in the riverbed. So it was it was like red hot, you know, half half um, half molten when it when it landed. It's kind of cool. That's one of my favorites. So so when volcanoes happen, sometimes. Uh, there's rocks that are just f basically pieces of molten that are just flying all over the place that can travel kilometers. You got it. They just, they can go a long way. And when I, like, I, you know, I've seen lava, lava rocks and things tougher things that have been ejected out of volcanoes before, but not so far away. So it was just crazy. Interesting. So. I, is, is, is there much mining near Puerto Vallarta? Yeah, there's actually some really interesting, um, uh, gold deposits in that neck of the woods, as well as um, some base metals things floating around too, mostly narrow vein mines. So we don't hear a whole lot about it, but um, yeah, there's some interesting projects there. 
In interesting. I, I, I vacationed in Puerto Vallarta many of times. Uh, Michael, last question for you. If I'm an investor yeah. in uh, nuclear fuels uh, or I'm considering being one and uh, I, I yep. want to evaluate management over 2024. What am I looking out for in terms of timelines, potential milestones, uh, that sort of stuff? All right. So I guess number one, I would say we've, you know, we've there's been a drawback in the market significantly. So I think we're in a great place for investing. Um, we should see in the next couple of months drilling announcement in um, in Wyoming as we re we return there and start, you know, pushing again. Um, we're looking to have two rigs running this year. Uh, we had a 200 drill hole program last year. 89 holes were drilled in six weeks. So fast, cheap, lots of results. Um, so good news flow from, from drilling uh, results. Uh, we've got, um, I think, some interesting stories in terms of expanding that. We've got 111 drill holes left. We'll be expanding that. We've got a, a permit application in right now. Um, and we'd look to be drilling all summer long this year. So that's really the key focus has been with that. Uh, doing a bit of work down on Moonshine. And as well, we've been reviewing things at Boot Heel and looking how we can move that project forward. So we may see some drilling there this year as well. So pretty exciting year. Lots of news. Uh, we're well funded for what we're doing this year and excited to be getting to work. All right. Well, Mike, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate your time. And uh We'll be keeping an eye on you guys as uh, your uh, news flow continues to roll out. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Really great. Appreciate it. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, please smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Also, let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks, everyone.